There we go. All right. I want to welcome everybody to this session on COVID copyright and creative commons. My name is Jen Kelly. I am the um, library liaison for copyright for faculty. And um, I want to thank everybody who submitted questions in advance. Um, I do want to apologize. There's a couple of questions I wasn't quite sure of. So if I don't address your particular question specifically, um, feel free to throw that question in the chat or send me an email if it's something like super specific. Um, but I will have opportunities for you to um, ask questions, but feel free at any time to just throw your questions in the chat. Um, like I said, Denise Cote will be keeping an eye on that and we'll point out questions um, as they come up or when there's you know time to answer those. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on chat. Um, and <laughs> a direct message asking me if it's okay for me to have all these C's on my presentation, um, if those copyrights are copyrighted. <laughs> Um, so let's see. Yeah, so we'll get started. We've got a great group here. I'm excited. Um, and I guess we'll get started. I am going to make you interact a little bit. Um, no breakout rooms. So I'll let you know that because I know that sometimes you say breakout rooms and then suddenly like your attendance numbers start dropping. People start running away. Just be a little couple of polls you can either participate in or not. So we'll get started here. I can figure out how to move my presentation forward. Here we go. All right. So there is going to be an active part of this, like I said. So either in another window on your phone, in a second device, whatever you'd like. Um, at some point, just we're going to have you go to www.menti.com. We're going to use the code 25-54-285. And I just found out that I have an unstable I'm going to turn off my video real quick. There we go. And let's see, I will also make sure that everybody has this information in the chat. Pop that in here. Um, and also on this is a link to this presentation. And I'll email this out to everyone after the fact too, but I just want to make sure that we have it. Uh, but Again, that link is www.menti.com and the code is 25542855. And the presentation link is bit.ly. Thank you for the hearts. <laughs> um, bit.ly COVID copyright. I think that's the right URL. If it isn't, someone will tell me. Excellent, okay. Here we go. Oh, so many hearts, you guys are the best. Okay, so here's question number one. Um, what's the purpose of copyright? Promote the creation and use of knowledge to prevent sharing information or to protect inventions. Let's see, for some reason, tell me what people are voting in. As we go, I'm trying out this Mentimeter thing, um, sort of, okay, we've got lots and lots of things going on here. Oh, no, oh, that's fun. Okay, it's not gonna show me what, oh, here we go. Okay, now we got it, everyone can see. There we go. All right, we've got live voting happening. I like it. Um, 17 people responded. We've got 24 people in the room. I'll give it another second if anyone wants to weigh in. Again, um, if you've just popped in, um, the information of where to go is at the top of the screen. It's menti.com and you're logging in with the code 25542855. All right, so it looks like people are split. Oh, oh it just shifted. Split again. <laughs> Promoting the creation, use of knowledge, protecting inven inventions. We have one person preventing sharing information. So um, protecting inventions is actually the role of, um, of patents, not copyright. Um, so copyright, the stated purpose in um, copyright law is to promote the creation of use and knowledge. And so this is why it's particularly useful for us in higher education or any kind of education, honestly, um, in doing research, in 
teaching and learning, um, copyright is, is pretty key and something that we, we come across a lot. So that's a good place for us to start. And I just wanna let you know that in this um, presentation, we will be talking um, specifically about copyright as well as Creative Commons, public domain and some related topics here. Um, and while the title of the presentation is COVID Copyright and Creative Commons, uh, I just wanna say that COVID-19 hasn't changed copyright law at all, uh, but moving teaching and learning online has made us think more critically about um, how we use, share and repurpose materials that are protected by copyright. So the pandemic especially has challenged us to think about creating equitably accessible course content for our students, including OER, library resources, online resources. Um, it's also gotten us to think about um, how we share things, whether we share things the same in a face-to-face -face classroom as we do in our online classrooms. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to um, address some of those issues. So we're going to start out with some quick primers on copyright, on fair use, Creative Commons licenses, and public domain, um, and then get to some of your questions. So we can make sure that we're all sort of on the same page when it comes to talking about all this good stuff. All right. Oh, I do have another question for you. Oh, and people look like they've already answered because I already moved ahead. Um, okay. So this, was, this is a question that somebody had. So you have to register something for it to be protected by copyright. Is this true or false? Some back and forth going on here. Looks like we've settled. All right, it is false. Um, yes, anything that is protected by copyright is automatically protected by copyright as soon as it is in a tangible form. So it could be, you know, think about something written, something either like in print or digitally, something captured on film, something recorded, um, a piece of artwork, photography, architectural plans, um, code for software, any of those things, as soon as it's captured, it is automatically protected by copyright. So we did have a question come in earlier um, that was about whether or not faculty should be putting the copyright symbol or somehow protecting their um, handouts or other materials um, with copyright. And your materials as you create them um, are protected already. It does put your information on there um, and I will address this a little bit in a moment but for any of you who have seen your materials show up on um, Course Hero or other sites where students might be sharing materials that you've created um, putting your copy you know a little c and the copyright date and your name on it doesn't prevent students from doing that but it does make it a little bit easier for you to then go to whoever's hosting this site, the Course Hero, and say, this is mine, can you take it down? So it doesn't hurt to put your name on there. And it also doesn't hurt if you're borrowing information from people or inspired by others or um, you know, building on the work of others to also include attribution information. So giving credit to the um, people you've borrowed from. So um, you don't have to register, it's already protected by copyright. And this goes for your students as well. So if your students are creating content, um, especially you know, if they're writing short stories, if they're writing essays, if they're writing um, you know, sort of newspaper pieces or creating infographics or artwork, your, stu your students own their copyright in that whole copyright in those materials that they've created for your class. Okay, on to the basics, copyright. All right, and again, throw your questions at me if you have them as they come up. Um, so copyright protects literary works. This includes things like poetry and novels, um, dramatic works, plays, scripts, choreographic notation, musical works, including compositions and lyrics, artistic works, photos, drawings, architecture. So basically copyright protects original works of authorship, um, whether they're published or unpublished. 
and copyright grants exclusive rights to the people who have created these things. So when you see all rights reserved written out, um, it's referring to these exclusive rights, which are reserved by the copyright owner and granted by copyright law. So as a copyright owner, you have the exclusive rights to make copies, to make derivatives, to sell your material, your work, um, to publicly perform it or to publicly display it. Um, so it's you who can decide whether or not someone else can do, whether they can make copies, make derivatives, sell the materials, publicly perform or publicly display. Um, so what does this mean ultimately? It means that you can't do any of those above things, make copies, make derivatives, et cetera, without the permission of the copyright owner is what that comes down to. There are of course exceptions and the biggest exception, there we go, is fair use. Um, and Mary saying, can you make a copy for your own personal use? Generally, I would say yes. Um, but ends <laughs> is what I'm actually always going to say. It depends. And I also need to say, and I didn't say this at the beginning, um, I am not a lawyer. So I cannot give you legal advice. Um, I can point you towards resources and best practices. So I just want you to know that like anything I say um, is not anything that would ever hold up in law, in the court. So <laughs> if on the off chance you find yourself in a courtroom situation, it won't do you any good to say that, well, Jen said. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'm not a lawyer. There's my caveat. Um, and I will, unfortunately, and I, and I apologize for this, but this is the way copyright is. A lot of it, I'm going to say things like, um, it depends, because it really does. There's, when we talk about fair use, especially, we're gonna notice that there's a balancing act going on here. Um, so fair use. Um, so fair use is part of the copyright law um, that allows us anybody to use copyright protected works for very specific purposes. And those purposes, again, heighten the whole point of copyright, right? Which is to encourage creative um, works and contribute to, to common knowledge. So these purposes where we can use copyrighted material include criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Right, so that is provided that we also consider the four factors of fair use. Why we're using it, so the purpose, the nature or what kind of work it is. Um, is it a piece of highly creative work like um, a painting or a novel or is it Nonfiction? Is it a piece of reporting? Is it a scholarly essay? Um, the third factor is how much of the work we're using and also what part of the work. So for example, talking about a movie, you'll see movie trailers, right? Or people on YouTube channels who talk about, um, you know, the best moments or look for Easter eggs or whatever they're doing. They're, they're doing commentary on that film and they're allowed to do that because it's fair use, so you can use comp pieces of that film. Um, but what you can't do is use something called the heart of the work, or not necessarily can't do, but does not favor fair use for you to use the heart of the work. So, you know, the denouement of the novel or the crux of the book or the best part of the movie, right? And the other part is the effect. And it's kind of the heart of the work and the effect kind of go hand in hand. So it's this idea of how of whether or not we're preventing the sale of the work. Um, so this factor requires balancing the benefit of the public benefit the public will derive if the use is permitted versus the personal gain the copy will receive if the use is denied. Right. So to some extent, this is if I share eight chapters of this 10 chapter book, is that fair to the person who wrote the book, to the copyright owner versus is there a benefit to the public with whom I am sharing this, 
All right. So for fair use, there's never a, this is fair use. Like all of these things are always fair use. So for example, education, it's not always fair use. We have to balance all of these little pieces. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment. Um, again, throw in questions if you have them as I go on. The next piece I want to talk about is Creative Commons licensing. And it's important to remember that Creative Commons, Creative Commons is a license on top of copyright. It's not instead of copyright. Basically, as I mentioned, copyright, you can't you know, share, sell, um, perform, et cetera, anything that's protected by copyright without permission. Creative Commons grants permission right up front. Um, and it kind of, it's a way of, for creators to say, you don't have to ask me, I'm just gonna let you. And there's different levels and each of these licenses provides a different level of openness for what the creator is allowing the public to do with their work. So the most open is um, attribution, the CC BY license, which means you can do whatever you want with this work as long as you give me credit. And so I'll use, I write a short story. I put a CC BY license on it. Any one of you can take that story, you can turn it into a movie, you can rework it and turn it into, um, you can write a sequel, you can um, create characters based on them and you know, have them do other things as long as you say, this is based on a by Jennifer Kelly. Um, attribution share alike is the next most open. And that's basically the same. You can take my story, you can um, do whatever you want to it, but you also have to put the same license on it, which means that if you create a movie based on my short story, then your movie also has to be attribution share alike. So someone else needs to be able to take your movie and turn it into, I don't know, a, a, a stage play, for example. Um, the next is attribution, no derivatives. So you can take my story um, and do what you like with it. Well, you can share it, um, but you can't make anything different out of it. All right, so you can't turn it into a play. You can't turn it into a movie. You can't um, rework it or remake it at all. Attribution, non-commercial. You can do what you like with my story as long as you're not making money off of it. <laughs> And then you get into some combined licenses, um, non-commercial share alike, non-commercial no derivatives. Um, just take what I already said and, and layer those on top of it. Again, these are, um, these are licenses that are on top of existing copyright. So it in, in no means takes the copyright and the exclusive rights away from the creator. So I am still the copyright owner of my story, even though I've let you take the story and turn it into um, a pop-up book. Let's see. So we have a question. Um, is how long we use the material something to consider? Okay. So in the class, that's a good one. I will come back to that. I just wanted to see if that was related to Creative Commons. So um, yes, that is a good question. Um, Karen has a question. Can you take your let see, take back your CC license later? The answer is no. Creative Commons license are um, irrev irrevocable. There you go, there's the accent on that, irrevocable. But my recommendation is always to keep track of when and where you get the materials that you're using. Um, so for example, when I use clip art that's available or you know images or something like that, that's that are available in a Creative Commons, I have this, kind of just a running spreadsheet of where I got the image and when I used it, because I have had instances, and this hasn't happened in a really long time, but I've used a, an image and then gone back to that image to find that the person had changed the license. Um, and they've, they just got, they decided that they didn't want to make it available under Creative Commons anymore, which technically 
it doesn't work in reverse. So if I use it and when I used it, it was under Creative Commons, it's still under Creative Commons. Um, there's, there could be some issues there, um, but basically that's how that works. Um, let's see, you said teachers or students worksheets, written work, et cetera, but if someone else finds it online and then copyrights and claims it as theirs, then um, should we always copyright if we ever want to use the materials we create for profit? Um, so you don't need to copyright anything because it's already copyrighted. Um, if someone takes your and claims that, it there, that it's theirs, you can reach out to them and tell them <laughs> that it's not theirs, that it's yours. And if they don't cease and desist, with their infringement on your copyrighted work, um, you sue them. Basically is how that works. <laughs> They've stolen from you and you can let them steal from you, which is an option. You can ask them to basically give it back or stop doing it. And if they don't comply, then it's within your legal rights to pursue the legal options. There we go, we'll say that. Um, and then if you want to create the materials for profit, um, you can always do that. If you own the copyright to something, you can always turn it into something that you sell. Um, so that's, that's not a problem. Um, so other thing that we're, that we're not really talking about is registering something, um, registering your copyright, which is a whole other shebang. And that's something that I'm happy to talk with you about. So for example, if you are publishing your own book or, um, or doing anything that's you know, outside of like a, a publishing house that would take care of that for you. Um, there is a process by which you register your copyright um, and that sort of like adds an extra level of, of legal protection, um, but it's not required. So again, that's a little bit more in the weeds than, um, than, I, than I can get in this particular presentation. All right, good questions, good questions. Okay, so here's a nice little picture of Creative Commons licensees um, and what you can do with them. So uh, let's see, so at the very top is public domain and we'll talk about that in just a second, but that's, all, that's just letting it all go. And we're familiar with public domain. Um, most things just kind of fall out of the public domain after they've been around for a good long while, they fall out of copyright. Some things are never protected by copyright, um, like materials that are created by the government. And so you can do whatever you want with those. You don't even need to do attribution with things that are in the public domain. Otherwise, you can see what you can and can't do with something depending on its license. So if something is Creative Commons um, attribution, commercial, that means you can copy and publish it. You have to put on the attribution. You can't use it for commercial purposes. Turn off my video. Oh, my video is already off. I'm still unstable. Um, you can modify and adapt it and you can change the license. Look good. All right. Public domain and no rights reserved. So things might be in the public domain if the copyright on it has expired, if copyright has been forfeited, if copyright has been waived, or if copyright is inapplicable. Um, so for example, works created by the government um, generally are in the public domain. So if you know, NASA publishes a how to build your own rocket, <laughs> you can turn that into a movie. Uh, <laughs> lots of times if you go to creative, if you look at Creative Commons licenses through Google, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, um, you'll see lots of images from .gov, especially if you're looking for pictures of teaching, you'll see lots and lots of images of people in fatigues teaching other people in fatigues because all of those images are um, in the public domain. There is a CC0 license, um, which is not really a license, but it's basically this waiver of copyright. So um, it's something that would normally not be in the public domain, but you as a creator are relinquishing copyright. Um, I said before that Creative Commons licenses are on top of copyright, the CC0 license, which isn't really a license, um, 
says, I don't want anything to do with copyright, take this, do whatever you want with it, pretend that it's, you know, however many years old, a hundred something years old, and, um, and you can do what you like. So in thinking about how we look at copyright and Creative Commons now in teaching online, um, relying on online materials, trying to make things accessible for our students, it's good to be thinking about um, fair use and the original purpose of copyright. So um, at the beginning of the pandemic last spring, a group of librarians, copyright librarians, um, released this public statement of library cop copyright, um, fair use and emergency remote teaching and research. And in that document, they, these librarians have, are making a, an argument that much of what we do in teaching um, and making things available to our students online falls under fair use because copyright is made to support teaching, research, and learning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those four factors of fair use and how we can think about what we do with copyright protected materials in our new virtual classrooms. So um, I've got another true and false question for you. <laughs> there are special copyright guidelines for classrooms, true or false? Apparently I need to forward and then backwards in order for us to see this, sorry about that. All right. Wait for some folks to vote. Looks like it's evened out here at 15. Um, and the end, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> 17. Okay, the answer is true. Yes, there are special copyright guidelines for classrooms. They are called the classroom guidelines. And it's really important for you to know that those are guidelines. And they're guidelines that were agreed to not by legislators, but by teachers and publishers. All right, and this is not copyright law, but they're guidelines that exist to help balance, again, the, the needs and interests of those two different groups, of educators and of publishers. So that's an interesting thing to think about, right? So there are people who stand to make money and or lose money um, in the design of these copyright guidelines. And the key distinction is that because copyright guidelines are not law, um, they are not in place of fair use, which is copyright law. And so you might be most familiar with copyright guidelines for ideas like you can only make um, you can only photocopy 10 pages of something, or it's okay to copy, photocopy 10 pages of something and share it with your whole class, or you can only share something for a short, short amount of time, or you can only do you know, one poem out of a book or one chapter out of a book. So all of those are guidelines that were der derived by, devised by people sitting down and kind of hashing this out. Um, but again, I want you to know that it's not the law. The law is a little bit less precise um, because it's, it's thinking about fair use. So when we think about fair use and teaching um, these days when we're online and things are a little bit different, um, we're, we're balancing these four things. The purpose of it, what are we trying to do with the work, the nature of the work, um, the amount of it, how much we're using, how much we're sharing, um, and the effect. So. Um, in the public statement, the fair use and emergency remote teaching and research, um, these librarians made a fair use assessment of what we're generally doing in our online classrooms and have argued for fair use for pretty much 
everything that we do. Um, the purpose, of course, is education, right? So that education balance it kind of tips fair use, um, tips the use into fair use. Um, it also has a public benefit um, when you think about the broader applications of, of um, education. And so our purpose is tilting that way. Um, the public statement says that the nature very rarely plays a role in fair use discussions, especially when the purpose is education. So if there were this were a commercial situation, this would be a lot different. You'd have to think about, you know, am I am I sharing something that's highly creative? Am I sharing something that's less creative? Um, in in this case, it's it's not necessarily um, an important factor, or at least that they they've decided that it's not necessarily um, the amount is always the hardest part. Um, the amount is flexible and situation specific, which of course is not helpful. Um, <laughs> and the guidance that that is that reproduce what's reasonable. Right? So you're making an argument that you need to share this information with your students now for these reasons. The effect, and I think this answers, hopefully answers Ed's question, um, the effect, again, thinking about whether or not this negatively impacts um, the copyright owner, use what's reasonable for time-limited purpose-specific uses. So if you need to make an entire book available to your students this semester, because the book just is not available any other way because nobody planned for this kind of thing, then use it and make a fair use determination. Do not use that, you know, digitized book for the rest of your time as an educator just because you happen to have it. If the book becomes available as an ebook later on, but you think your PDF is a lot easier to work with, that's not a really good argument. Um, we're thinking about time limited, perfect, purpose specific uses. And so while I can't say you can only use things for one semester, you can only use one thing academic year, you can only use one, something for um, the time it takes for students to read it, is something that you have to determine yourself and balance that against these other three factors, um, it is definitely something to consider. Um, in general, outside of pandemics, um, the sort of guideline is thinking about, um, for classroom use especially, like using it in the, in the classroom in a face-to-face -face situation, is thinking, you know, is it more beneficial to my students and to my, my teaching to make a copy and give it to my students right now because this is where it fits into the curriculum. Um, I only just discovered it. We're only going to be using it right now because it's very specific and time bound. Um, if, you, if that makes more sense than going through the trouble of writing to get permission um, in order to use something, then use the thing without permission. If you're gonna be using it semester to semester, you have time to ask permission and so ask permission. Especially for educational purposes, um, unless you're dealing with a really, you know, crotchety publishing house, most of the time individual copyright owners will, will work out some sort of permission structure with you. And either the library can help you with as well. So, Again, if you're using something over and over again, frequently, you have the ability to ask permission um, and to go through normal channels and make sure that um, you're not going around copyright just for your convenience. Does, I hope that makes sense. Okay, let's talk a little bit. Nope, oh, here's a question. Um, I've reviewed books at the Open Library website for private use, but I've never recommended it to students because I think that there are live lawsuits from authors, publishers. Your thoughts on the website? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I'm not super familiar with it, but here's, 
here's my thoughts with sharing things um, with students that may or may not be a violation of copyright. So obviously you don't ever want to download something that is and make it available, make something available if it's already been made available illegally, right? Because that's illegal in and of itself. Um, sharing links, however, is, I mean, clearly if something, <laughs> so let's, let's say, okay, there's a, a bootleg version of a movie that's in the, in the theaters, we'll say in the theaters now, that's available on YouTube. That's clearly not going to be um, legally available. And so sharing that is not, is not we'll, we'll call it not like above board. Uh, but if it's something um, like it's, there's a lawsuit going on, it's still con in contention. Um, sharing a link isn't with your students isn't a bad thing. Um, sharing links to YouTube videos that may or may not be like 100% whatever. Um, my feeling is share the link, but give like also know like as an educator that it's it might not be there later on. So if it is the subject of a lawsuit or if it is a vi infringement of somebody's copyright, um, those things might disappear. So it's harder to rely on those things for educational perspective. Um, yes, and Ed, that's a really good point. So the time element is a really good reason to regularly update asynchronous classes or update the content in any of your classes, really. Like um, thinking about how often you you are using the same materials over and over again, it, it does a couple of things. So A, it, it's good practices for, for copyright. B, it also helps when it comes to um, plagiarism and cheating. So addressing that issue of, um, you know, your worksheets being, you know, ending up on um, Course Hero or someplace else. You know, if you're constantly updating your content, then materials that are from last semester won't necessarily um, be relevant in the upcoming semesters, if that makes sense. So yes, it, there's always a good idea to be updating um, the materials that you're using in your class. So we did have a couple of questions come in earlier about finding images that are licensed for reuse. Um, a couple quick tips here on how to find these. A lot of you probably regularly use Google Images. Um, Google Images is really great and easy to use, but know that just because it's in Google Images doesn't mean that you can just use it for whatever, right? Some things are um, not licensed for reuse. You do wanna check those things. And I will show you how to do that in just a moment. There's a Creative Commons search that allows you to search not just images, but other as well. So sound, like audio files that you can use, music that you can put into your classes um, or use as like background if you're doing a, you know, if you want to add music to the introductions to your pre-recorded lectures, you can do that. Um, there's all kinds of great stuff there. Flickr um, will also allow you to select Creative Commons licenses. And then Denise's Open Education COD site has um, some additional suggestions. So we'll take a quick look at those. Um, and Denise, thank you very much for following up on, on Bob's question. Okay, let me show you, let's see. I need to bring this to the front, just one moment. Okay, sharing this new page. So what I have here is a, Google image search of tea, because it's just about tea time. And I just want to show this information. I'm showing this. Okay. So all these images, they're great. You can't just copy and paste all of them or most of them. What you want to do is you'll see here right at the top, we've got tools. I click tools. One of my options is usage rights. And Google images used to have more options allow you to drill down a little bit more for creative for the different types of Creative Commons licenses, but now it's Creative Commons licenses. And now everything here is at least going to be something that you can reuse. Um, 
because the most restricted thing that, that you would need to consider, say, if you're using an image for a PowerPoint presentation or using image for um, I don't know, the, the course banner in your Blackboard course, um, the most restrictive thing you would want to be thinking about is non-commercial and this is education. So you don't have to worry about that because chances are you wouldn't be sharing, you wouldn't be doing derivatives. Uh, but if you are thinking of those things, this is how you find out. So as you can see very easily where the image is coming from. So for example, um, anything coming from Wikimedia Commons, um, the license information is really easily readily available, um, which is one of the reasons why I really like Wikimedia Commons. So all the information is here. I've got different file sizes. Um, it does tell me, let's see the license information. So it's Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike. And it also should give me somewhere in here um, how to share the file. So that happens, I think, when you go to download the original file in somewhere. Oh, that's not happening there. But um, it gives you all the information you need to cite it. So you've got your author here. You've got the title of it. You've got description. You've got a link that takes it right takes you right to it. So everything you need to know about this file is here. You can download it in different sizes. It's really handy. Um, other things, so you've got different stock photos that are making their things available by license, specific licenses. I know Pixabay, um, most of their images, whether they're photos or um, vector images are in the public domain. So you don't even need to put somebody's um, attribution in there. But you always want to check, always check before you just copy and paste. Don't copy out of Google. So I mean, right now I could do a control C and copy that image or save the image, but instead take the extra time to click the image. And then you'll see over here some more information about it and go directly to the source to get that image file. Um, and encourage, these are best practices, encourage your students to do the same. The next one is the Creative Commons search. So this allows you to search all kinds of different things, images, music, like I said. Um, it does give you options to use commercially or to modify and adapt. But if you just want, again, a picture for a PowerPoint presentation, I'm just going to do another search for tea. Um, we've got a nice filter on the left hand side, which allows me to um, limit by specific licenses. And I can look for specific sources. So if I only want Flickr, and I know that those are, you know, photos. So it does a, a great job of helping you limit and filter. Um, and you can see, here we go, I like this picture of somebody's tea shelf. We've got all the information I need here to reuse it. And I can just copy and paste that attribution. It's kind of exactly like what we tell our students to do when they're using material from the library's website or I'm sorry, the library, from the library's catalog or from databases. So just copy and paste your um, attribution. Oh, uh, Flickr. When I do a search in Flickr, um, you see any license. So that gives me things that are all rights reserved and um, otherwise, but I can limit to all Creative Commons, commercial use, modifications, um, no known copyright restrictions, or US government works. So some good options there. So we've got some beautiful tea sites. I'm guessing a lot of these are coming from um, museums and other things like that. Finally, the um, opencod.org um, images, some options for you to, to look at here, the Noun Project on Splash, Pixabay, which I mentioned, Flickr, which we looked at, um, how to do that Google image search. So, so there's some really great clip art and inclusive stock photo collections out there that you can find now. Um, and this, this page has a few of them. And Denise, I'm going to share a couple others with you as well. Um, if you're interested, but you can also find those on the faculty professional development um, website. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you. Sure. Um, and Denise has done a really good job here of telling you what license they're made available under. So we've got CC BY, um, CCO, um, which is no 
um, restrictions at all, and then CC BY and CND. All right, let's go back to any questions about images. I know that's something that I get a lot of questions from um, over the course of, of your average semester. People mostly have questions about using um, images. Um, yes, Joel shared one. Um, Pexels is another site. There's a lot of them and they're so easy to use and they are just like in the public domain for the most part. Um, the creators have, have abdicated their, their rights for whatever reason. <laughs> um, and you can just do whatever you like with those and download them in different sizes. Okay, what are we doing on time here? Excellent. Um, so here's some best practices for teaching online. Um, use the library's electronics resources and share permanent links to your students. So thank you, Lara, thank you so much. Um, use the links as opposed to downloading PDFs and sharing PDFs, right? Um, a link is, a, is an address and that's never a violation of copyright. So um, it could be problematic in some circumstances to download a PDF and share a PDF. Um, most of the time it's not, but let's just say it could be. It's never problematic for you to copy a link and share a link. Um, use materials that are in the public domain when you can. That way you don't even have to think about it. Um, if, it's, if it's something that's freely available um, through something like the Hadi Trust or a um, bunch of other resources, I know we've got some pages in the library's website that, that outline um, where you can find public domain materials. Use those, do whatever you want with them. This is why when you know you see public schools putting on plays, they're always you know, old things because those things are in the public domain and nobody has to get any permission or do any licensing. You can do whatever you want with Cole Porter songs. Um, use Creative Commons licensed images um, like we just talked about instead of pulling them off of Google or from other places. Also know that the library offers image databases and um, you can find the information about um, how you can use them right there. Generally, because we're, they're academic educational databases, the images can be used for academic educational purposes. Provide links to materials when possible. So if you are including an image, um, give a link to that image. If you are want somebody to read an article, give them the link to that article, um, as opposed to copying and pasting. Um, an example I will give you is my dad loves to share things from the internet with me. He, because he's my dad, and I know some of you I've talked to you, he's a wonderful um, gentleman. <laughs> he, he, um, he's, he's not super great with the internet and with computers. And um, what he does is copies the entire content of a web page and puts it in a Word doc and sends that to me. Sometimes sends that to many people. That's not copyright appropriate. So um, what I would rather he did is give me a link to that article. And I'm not sure why he doesn't do that because it would be so much easier, but that's an extreme example. Um, I'm assuming that you're not doing that, but again, um, provide links. Another great thing to think about is sharing materials within Blackboard. If you are sharing a PDF, uploading a PDF, especially if it's um, something that you, you've made copies of yourself and are sharing with your students because um, it's not available digitally otherwise, don't do that through email, um, upload it to Blackboard. That way it is available only to those students involved in your class, involved, enrolled in your class during that short amount of time. Um, this is as opposed to just sharing it on your own personal website. If you have a course website, you're using like WordPress or something that's available outside um, a password protected site. Um, and again, make resources available only as long as they're needed. If you have your course put in sections and you're done with section one and, you're never, and your students are never need to go back to the section one information, Make that, make that PDF unavailable, make those images unavailable. Um, or again, just use it for the semester, not the next semester. Always, always, always best practices for everything. And this is a really good best practice to model for your students. Provide citations or attributions for all the materials that you use. Um, embed code is a 
good question can. Um, embed code is kind of like a link because it's a live link to content. So um, if that content went away, the embed code wouldn't work anymore. So yes. And I think usually because content creators have to enable the use of an embed code, then I'm guessing that they, they have granted permission. If you're going a long way out of your way to create an embed code for something that isn't embeddable <laughs> um, inherently, then that might be problematic. Um, but yes, yeah, I think that's generally, again, better than say, so yes, an embed code to a YouTube video is better than downloading the YouTube video and then uploading a YouTube a file of that YouTube video. Um, the last suggestion I have is using the library's fair use checklist. So we talked a little bit about balancing those four factors. We do have a checklist that will um, help you do that. Um, let's see, I will go to that in just a moment. Um, and I, I haven't really filled this one out. I don't know if we have more questions for this, um, but best practices for creating um, open educational resources for your students, keep track of your assets. So this is what I was talking about in terms of creating a spreadsheet, where you're getting material, what license that material is made available to, um, to you under, <laughs> trying to work out my clauses as I speak here, what license, under which licenses the material has been made to you. How about that? Um, and sometimes that's just a link. You can get really fancy about it. Um, but again, attribute all of your materials. Where did it come from? Um, there, See, Creative Commons itself has a very good sort of template for the kind of citation you should be giving. But basically, it, um, the same kind of thing if, you, if you've ever taken a speech class or you are a speech instructor or your students do speech, it's um, sort of a, a who, when, where type of thing. Um, who's in, responsible for it? What's it called? Where did you find it? Um, put that in your citation or your attribution, all right? So you'll see throughout this presentation, I've had images. Um, these are from the noun project, these little black and white ones. They have the information about them built really like. Um, ideally, they should have links that take you to the source. Um, this presentation right now isn't interactive and I can't click through it. Um, but normally I would hyperlink that to um, the specific file page of the image and also a link to the creators page as well as a link to the site. Um, could we ask someone from the library to check our Blackboard site for any issues? Um, probably not. <laughs> that would be me um, in terms of check, checking for issues, but if you have specific questions, but I'm going to guess that you don't have issues. Um, like I don't, I don't anticipate that the lot, many courses are are full of violations of copyright. Um, but if you ever have any specific questions, you can, um, you can ask your your liaison librarian, um, and your liaison librarian might be able to answer but your liaison librarian might also come directly to me, um, in which case you can you can just come directly to me if you'd like. Um, I do want to, in the last moment we have here, um, please throw your questions into the chat. I want to, let's see, give a new share and just really briefly take a quick look at the fair use checklist page. Um, here we go. So this is in the library's website, it's library.cod.edu slash copyright law. Underneath fair use, there's the fair use checklist, and it goes over a little bit of information about fair use, um, the benefits of the checklist, using the checklist as a roadmap for making decisions, but also keeping track of the checklist. Um, if for some reason, and I'm not aware of this happening at COD in the years that I've been here, um, if for some reason there were some sort of issue, you would have this um, fair list checklist to show that you actually went through the process of evaluating. Um, and also, I just want to go back to quick, 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 the COD copyright guide, because this came up just peripherally talking about Course Hero and Chegg. Um, there is a link on the homepage here for the copyright takedown request. Um, if you ever find 
materials that you own the copyright for, um, that you are the copyright holder for, um, things that should not be shared from your courses, you can um, ask to have them taken down. You can either do that yourself or um, le learning technologies can do that to have, so for example, your PowerPoint slides or your quizzes or your homework assignments taken down from Course Hero. Okay, any final questions? I'm going to finally stop sharing. Got, I know a lot of people and a lot of questions and I'm willing to hang out and answer questions for a little bit longer if we need. Um, Jill says, if you need to get permission to use a book semester after semester, what's the best way to do that? Or is that a question for another time? Um, that's a good question. And so the, the copyright guide does have information about getting permission. Um, it's something that you can go directly to the publisher with your question, but you can also um, reach out to the library. And Denise, do you know if that's still Larissa? would handle this um, to help work out permissions for that, especially if it's something that has a price attached to it. Denise, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yes, okay. that would be correct. So you would um, contact the acquisitions department in the library. I would probably just go through my um, liaison to do that. Um, so Jill, I think your liaison is on. Jason Burke, so you would go through him. It's actually me. <laughs> Which makes it even easier. Yeah, okay. Good questions. Any other questions? This was great, Jen. Thank you. Sure, thank you. And I will make the recording available and the slides are available as well. Um, Let's can, I, see. can I put this up on um, this recording up on um, OpenCOD? Just mm -hmm. okay, thanks. Yep, absolutely. Oh, uh, we've got a question. So, should we ever need to copyright our work as teachers? Um, register your copyright. Probably not. Would be my guess. So you shouldn't ever. I can't think of a reason why you would need to go through the copyright.gov process registering your copyright. Um, and, but again, those, yes, Adam has that good, <laughs> that good suggestion. You do get more punitive damages in a lawsuit. <laughs> it can help <laughs> those massive amounts of dollars you'll get from your, um, your syllabus or worksheet. Um, to Kathy's question, can you copyright your, your syllabus is protected by copyright, um, but you could, if you wanted to register it through the cop, um, copyright.gov. So again, thinking about those two distinctions, things are already protected by copyright, um, but they are not registered for copyright. And again, the only real reason you would want to register it is for um, if you wanted to, to sue someone basically. So um, any other questions? Minutes? All right. And just know that um, I am available. You can send me questions um, and I will do what I can to answer them. I appreciate everyone being here. And oops, I think I just sent that just to Eric. Sorry about that. Kelly J <laughs> at cod.edu. Awesome. Thanks, you all, so much. Thank you. Sure. Bye. Bye.